There was a time before automobiles and shopping malls and cell phones when you had to work pretty hard to get the things you needed just to live a reasonable life. In fact, most of life's essentials, like the clothing on your back, the food on your table, even the house in which you lived, were the product of muscle, human as well as animal, and individual skill. Because you had to grow or make the things you needed, it took a lot longer to get them. Want fast food? Forget it. No drive-in chicken joints here. A new house, a bigger barn? Start with the trees at the edge of the forest. But about 200 years ago, all that began to change with the help of mills. These early factories turned out machine-made products that could be bought in stores, and they offered a new way of working that changed the way people lived. Societies that once responded to the rhythm of the sun and seasons now move to the beating of the clock. This industrial revolution would bring giant factories and working classes entrepreneurs and inventors, and an era we call mill time. So what did people do 200 years ago if they needed a necessity of life like clothing? Say you need a new pair of pants or a shirt. There's no mall nearby. So you have to make them. And the first thing you must do is gather the raw material. Now in some regions you turn to cotton or flax. But here at New England's old Sturbridge village you turn to sheep for their wool. Of course, it wasn't that easy. Sheep shearing was a laborious process for the shearer and the sheep. And then you had to have someone with enough skill to turn all this raw wool into cloth. After cleaning the wool, it had to be carded. This took strong fingers and prickly brushes, like pet brushes, to untangle and separate the fibers, and to create wispy tubes of wool called slivers. You then stretch the slivers into yarn on a spinning wheel. Notice how the yarn gets twisted as it winds onto the spindle? This makes it strong enough to weave without breaking. You turn yarn into fabric on a loom, and this is a typical hand loom. Now, weaving was done by both men and women, so I should probably do okay at this. First of all, we have to set up the loom by drawing threads from the warp beam behind the loom across the top to another beam near my feet. The warp threads pass through harnesses, which I can raise or lower by pressing down on these foot pedals. And when I do that, it creates a space between alternating sets of warp threads. I'm going to take the shuttle, which is this wooden contraption with a spool of yarn in it called a bobbin, and I'm going to push it across through that space, perpendicular to the warp threads. I then press it down change pedals to raise the other harness to create that over and under pattern that you get used to seeing in weaving. I send the shuttle back through, pull it snug, tamp it down, and repeat this process over and over again until there's something else I'm supposed to do or my arms fall off. You can see 
just how much time is going to go into this to produce enough fabric to make clothes. I mean, there's the carding and the spinning and the weaving. Then there's the cutting and the stitching and so on, which sort of explains why people back then would have had relatively few clothes. But by the middle of the 1700s, help was on the way. And it began with water-powered machines. For centuries, people had used the turning force of water wheels to help with tough jobs, like driving blades for sawing wood. And rotating coarse stones for grinding grain into flour. But eventually, Water wheels began to power more complicated devices that would revolutionize cloth making, like this carding machine. What an improvement over the pet brushes. And by rolling out wispy slivers all day long, it was a great labor-saving device. But this was even better. I'm standing next to a machine called a water frame. It was created by the famous English inventor Richard Arkwright, this model's from the 1780s, to spin cotton into yarn. Though it looks fairly complex, it really isn't. It runs on water power, just like the carding machine and saw blades we saw earlier. The cotton in the top spools is drawn out by the action of the machine, which twists it nice and tight, and then gathers the yarn onto these bottom spools. It works just like a hand spinning wheel. Ninety-six of them, actually. So it's little wonder that spinning by machine would eventually make spinning by hand obsolete. In no time, spinning mills began springing up all over England. By the late 1700s, these mills were putting whole villages to work, making yarn inside the new factories or weaving it into cloth in their homes. The spinning industry was so successful, it quickly spread to the rest of Europe. And it was only a matter of time before it reached England's former colonies in America as well. All mills need a steady supply of running water. And here in New England, there's plenty of rain and melting snow to feed powerful rivers that once drove the big wheels of the new textile mills. But any river's flow can be unpredictable. Sometimes there's too much water, sometimes not enough. So to control the power of the river, mill owners built dams. Now this old dam on the Branch River in Rhode Island is a typical mill dam. It doesn't completely block the river, but it raises the height of the water to create an elevated mill pond. Now, if we dig a channel called a head race from the pond to the mill, that pent up water behind the dam will flow through the head race, turn the wheel, and then rejoin the river through the tail race. So dams and their ponds acted like storage tanks for the H2O fuel the water wheel engines ran on. You can still find scores of mill dams all along New England's rivers. But this one in Pawtucket, Rhode Island is special because it powered America's very first spinning mill. Legend has it that in 1789, a young entrepreneur named Samuel Slater defied the laws of England by supervising the construction of English-style cotton spinning machinery at the mill in Pawtucket. England had tried to protect its fledgling monopoly on spinning machines with patents, but Slater, who worked in the mills, understood how to make similar machines. 
and came to America to seek his fortune. Other Rhode Island mills quickly followed Slater's successful venture, including the picturesque Wilkinson Mill right next door, which houses a beautifully restored water wheel and gives us a pretty good idea of how a powertrain actually works. At the Wilkinson Mill, water from the head race flows into a wheelhouse, where it steadily turns the big water wheel. The wheel is connected to revolving metal gears. And as the gears turn in rhythm with the wheel, they rotate a vertical pole called the main shaft. The main shaft rises through the ceiling and extends all the way to the top of the building. On each floor, the vertical shaft turns horizontal shafts that hang just below the ceiling. A leather belt carries the power from those horizontal shafts to a pair of pulleys above each machine. Now, to get the power to the machine itself, I'm going to turn the machine on by sliding the belt from one pulley to another. And voila, the machine works. Now, this is not a spinning machine, it's a lathe. A lot of mills, like Wilkinson, had their own machine shops. This is a wood lathe. It was actually used to produce those humble workhorses of the spinning industry, the bobbin. Yarn from the spinning machines was spooled onto bobbins. And in the beginning, that's all the textile mills produced, yarn. But by the 1820s, inventors had finally figured out how to make machines that could take all those spools of yarn and weave them into cloth. This power loom is weaving a plain piece of fabric. All the things I had to do on the hand loom are now being performed by this machine, only a whole lot faster. In fact, the wooden shuttle I threw by hand whips its thread back and forth so quickly, we have to slow down the action for you to see it. These looms could be very dangerous. If a shuttle like this should break free, it could pierce your flesh like a bullet. If you got your sleeve caught, it could cost you an arm. But when the power loom was perfected, weaving, like yarn spinning before it, would move from the home to the mill. Many newer mills became huge, as owners sought greater profits by bringing carding, spinning, and weaving all under the same roof. As more and more mills sprang up, there was increased competition and the occasional dispute over issues like backwater. Backwater would occur when one mill's dam impeded the natural flow of the river to the point where water wheels in upstream mills couldn't turn properly. Because water was so valuable as fuel, clashes over water rights were common. But with the demand for machine-made textiles soaring, it looked like everyone's profits would just keep flowing. 